Acceleration. Good morning and welcome to Business Acceleration, Ditch the Rear View Mirror. First, let me tell you a little about Tinderbox and the work we do to support business owners and leaders, and importantly, why we're different. We assist businesses to be more successful by building on their achievements to date and substantially improving their performance. Through rigorous analysis, we identify the opportunities and respective actions required to be more successful. We assist the business to develop and implement the necessary structures and business processes to deliver profitable growth. We've all worn the t-shirt, as you've heard, and walked the walk, and can therefore empathize with business owners and managing directors. We aim to fashion the appropriate solution which is not pre-prescriptive or formulaic, but based on our analysis and our experience and expertise to give you a unique solution to your challenges and opportunities. We focus on what we know well and assign the appropriate Tinderbox personnel based on core competencies and experience. We use experienced specialist consultants to deliver these bespoke solutions. In the process, we transfer skills to the client's team as quickly as possible, enabling them to progress and continue without further outside help, and we don't outstay our welcome. Since our formation in spring 2009, we've helped over 300 organisations tackle the complexities of modern business, whilst helping to build on their achievements and substantially improving their performance. Our success is in creating long-term sustainable business impact in both challenging and good economic environments. We have a 100% success rate with the clients which we work as we focus on delivering a great return on investment and delivering practical solutions. We believe that every business should have the chance to be successful or more successful. So today we're here to introduce you to ideas and changes that you can make to your business to create a positive future and adapt to the very different market conditions that we see as a result of the ongoing challenges that we all currently face. Our goal is to show you tools and processes that if implemented correctly will facilitate not only your ability to survive in a challenging and dynamic business environment, but to go on and thrive. So over the next 40 minutes, we're going to cover an overview showing that when faced with disruption, businesses succeed or fail based upon their ability to adapt. What's required from you as a leader to make these changes? We'll introduce some concepts and methods to assist you in creating your future business and the benefits to you, your business and the teams that will result in making these changes. At the end, we'll hold a question and answer session so that we can answer any questions that you have along the way. Just post them into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. It's an interactive session, so please hover your mouse at the bottom edge and submit those questions through the Q&A button, and we'll deal with them at the end of the presentation. So let's start with a quick poll to make sure we correctly understand a little bit about how each of you are feeling.
Well, that's actually quite a positive result with uh, 50% of you expressing that you're optimistic about the future and have confidence in the business going forwards. Um, few of you are feeling that you're fighting to survive and uh, fighting for your business to survive at 7%. Uh, 12% are in the recovery scenario and 15% uh, confident that they can recover. So that altogether is about 72% of people are feeling pretty confident about the future. And that's somewhat different to recent information that was on a LinkedIn survey that reported that 45% of customer di company directors feel their business will be worth off, while only 22% felt they'd be better off. So it's great that we've got such an optimistic and confident group of people on the room, and hopefully we'll be able to assist you in taking that further. So let's move into a little bit more around the presentation of why you're here today. COVID-19, coronavirus, lockdown. Less than two years ago, these words were not in common use. Today, we hear them, we continue to hear them virtually every minute of every day as we go through the roller coaster that is this pandemic. After almost two years, every newscast and newspaper appear to remain full of the latest news on the coronavirus. So we are without doubt continuing to be in uncertain times. No one truly 100% ever knows where we're heading, but we have been and continue in many ways to be in uncharted territory. There is and will continue in reality to be disruption in almost every market. And as we say regularly to our clients, business owners and leaders must possess three things, agility, flexibility, and the willingness to show initiative and try initiatives. If they're to come through any disruption, and go on to thrive. We're already helping businesses to do this in some of the toughest situations. Businesses generally did have a good run in the UK in the latter half of the 20th century, and many businesses and SME business owners have experienced great success during that period. However, the start to the 21st century has arguably been much more volatile with ever more market disruption. Change is a constant. And it is a truth that those who master adapting to change are those that survive and thrive. The COVID pandemic has been and continues to be seriously di disruptive. It's been more severe, sudden and encompassing than any other recent disruption. I was traveling on the road yesterday and even there I can tell there's still not as much traffic as there was running into Christmas. But as shocking and heartbreaking for many as COVID-19 is, Disruption itself is not an unprecedented event for business and indeed is becoming a more frequent occurrence in all markets. Businesses have been and are continuously being challenged by change and disruption. Let's just look at a few examples. The technology and online revolutions happened and with it put an end to many businesses. Tapes to CDs and DVDs, film to digital, discs to memory sticks, public phones to mobile technology, and paper to e-readers. Taking a specific example, how many of you have visited your local blockbuster store in the last year? Perhaps no other example quite defines the concept of industry disruption as the blockbuster Netflix story. It will potentially go down as one of the biggest forehead slaps and missed opportunities in history. Blockbuster had thousands and stores, thousands of stores after the turn of the millennium. Business was booming. It couldn't possibly end. Video, DVD was forever. Streaming, pay-to-view TV and the internet and pretty much all video rental went out of business because they didn't see change, didn't see the bigger picture, so it too late and couldn't adapt. Who remembers Friends Reunited? How many still use it? They too failed to adapt and develop and were overtaken by Facebook and left in the dust. The 2008 crash where many businesses simply froze and receded and others experimented, adapted and thrived. Yes, thrived. It's not uncommon for us to experience the, these kinds of situations in our assignments, especially with businesses that have been successful and been around for a while. One such example is of a merchandising company 
designing, printing, and selling licensed music and film merchandise, such as t-shirts and memorabilia. They'd grown profitably to 10 million pound turnover, so no doubt they'd been successful and had valuable licenses for major corporations in the film and music business, such as Disney and Harry Potter. Their primary route to market was to the high street retail outlets. And we all know what has happened there, don't we? Basically, the business had worked harder and harder at its business model, trying to sell more and more to these struggling retail shops and increase their share of an ever diminishing market by reducing prices, extending payment terms and increasing the stock holdings within the stores, a recipe for absolute disaster. While sales held up, profitability just disappeared. Their challenges were a direct result of a failure to adapt to the changing market and disruption to the business environment, impacting upon their customers' businesses. These disruptions may not have been as severe, sudden, or as encompassing as COVID-19 has been, but in reality, most business environments have been challenged by some form of significant disruption over the years. COVID-19 will pass, but disruption will continue from many different directions. So what can we learn from these experiences? Firstly, many businesses fail because they fail to be flexible and adaptable. Simply put, failure to adapt leads to business failure. Businesses fail by trying to work harder at what they do and have always done, rather than working smart on the future. Doing what you have always done simply will not do. Businesses who act this way avoid creativity and experimentation and recede as a result. Businesses that succeed and come out stronger do so because they do adapt to the new environment they find themselves in. They think about the future, they challenge their people to think about the future and they ask themselves, how can we come out of this a different, smarter and stronger business? How do we take advantage of what is different now in our marketplace and the business community? We strongly advocate that now is the time to embrace a new set of powerful mindsets, optimistic, open, infinite and questioning. It's okay to glance back at the past, but today it's time to look to the future, to look forward and ditch the rear view mirror. So let's look at how we can influence and create our own future filled with new opportunities. So what must you consider and implement to become a stronger and more resilient business? Whatever sector you're in, things have changed for good as a result of the last two years events. Some people have had very positive experiences, but many have struggled. We're now going to look at some of the key attributes that you and your business will require to achieve more resilience and a strength in depth, and also to share with you some real life examples that will demonstrate what can be achieved. The first key requirement is for your business to have flexibility, illustrate a real willingness to be changed. To be blunt, without this willingness to change, nothing significant can be achieved. In today's business world, business leaders need to consistently show the desire and ability to take advantage of new opportunities. Their businesses need to move quickly and easily, showing agility, thereby becoming an agile business. These types of businesses have a strong core that provides stability, but they also move flexibly by adapting and changing to ever-changing market demands. Thirdly, it is vital for business leaders to show initiative. To do this, they think about the current situation, ass assess the impact of it, and commit to action new ideas that will enable their business to drive forward to achieve the desired results, never more important than when faced by an uncertain situation like we've been through. How many of you tuning in today started your own business? Well, I know the answer will be many, if not all, because that's the group you belong with. You showed initiative in starting that business, and you must continue to show that quality. We'll take a look at a company now who did indeed show initiative. So my first question is, how many of you have owned a Nokia mobile phone at some point in your life? Once again, a high number of you will say yes, especially those of us with gray hair. But how many of you own a Nokia phone today? 
I suspect not many, and that tells the tale. So here's a little bit of background. On the 12th of May, 1865, a single paper mill operation was founded in Finland. Yes, it's a paper mill. That company became a multinational corporation known as Nokia, and ultimately the world leader in mobile phones. Along the way, they were involved in many different and varied products from selling rubber galoshes to high technology. They were innovative. Then here's the point. They failed to adapt and did not successfully seek to learn about, utilize or adapt to smartphone technology. And they subsequently lost their position in the world of phones. This illustration shows it can happen to the very best businesses. Blockbuster, as mentioned earlier, is another classic example. The message is that no business, no matter how large or small, no matter how long its history, is immune from being outthought, outdeveloped, and overtaken. I wonder how many of you know what a GUI is. For those of you who don't know, or don't think you know, but you will recognize it, a GUI is a form of user interface that allows users to interact with electronic devices through graphical icons instead of text-based user interfaces, typed command labels, or text navigation. The fact is we all use a GUI every day, frequently, across all of the modern devices we work with. But where did it come from? Well, it's claimed no single person invented it, but it evolved and developed over time through various companies' input and people in those companies developing the technology. Here's what Steve Jobs has to say following a visit to Xerox's research center in the US. It's Steve Jobs, one of the biggest names in a brand new industry. At the height of Apple's early success in December 1979, Jobs, then all of 24, had a privileged invitation to visit Xerox Park. And they showed me really uh, three things. But I was so blinded by the first one that I didn't even really see the other two. Uh, one of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a networked computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I'd ever seen in my life. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong, but we didn't know that at the time. It's still, though, they had the germ of the, of the idea was there, and they'd done it very well. And within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this someday. The mouse is a pointing device that moves a cursor around the display screen. Adele and her colleagues showed the Apple programmers an Alto machine running a graphical user interface. A selected window displays above other windows, much like placing a piece of paper on top of a stack on a desk. The visitors from Apple saw a computer that was designed to be easy to use, a machine that anybody could operate and find friendly, even the French. Choose one. Following this visit, Jobs intuitively knew that Apple could cease to exist if it didn't change course and adopt and adapt it for their business. His response was, it was better to turn the company inside out from within than have the company turned outside, inside out from the outside. In many ways, proving that ideas are important, but implementation is everything. The reality is that the limit of what is possible in the future is only limited by the limit of our imagination. So don't be constrained by what you're currently doing or have done before. The past is gone and today is history tomorrow. Be prepared to take advantage of the opportunities that lie in front of you. It goes without saying that all great thinkers are strong in the imaginative area. They develop ideas and creative thoughts that change things. Here, Einstein succinctly explains what imagination is about. So how can we all best use our imagination? We can do it best by visualizing an action, object, picture, or scene in the future, like the person who invented the hole in the wall cash machine. For those who can remember all the way back to the 60s, the only way to get cash was to go to the bank, queue, and draw out your money via cashier. Somebody used their imagination, thought of a completely different way, and pictured even then that the world of cash access could look, sound, and feel like in the years ahead. Have a think. 
What is your market going to look, sound and feel like in three months time? A year, use your imagination. Who'd have thought back then that we would today be using our mobile phones to pay, that we'd even be have mobile phones and that we'd be using those mobile phones to pay for transactions. So using your imagination is critical to building a successful future. How else do you create a future that does not yet exist? Given the changing paths of business and markets, it's important to have the flexibility to take a different path, the agility to do this effectively, and the initiative to commit to the course of action. It can be quite a scary path, new territory, new processes, and potentially new markets. But the realms of possibility are only constrained by your thoughts and actions. There are sound ways also to enable you to reduce the risk and make the process manageable. We'd, like, we'd now like to share some of the methods with you. I'm going to hand over to David. Thank you. Thanks, Graham, and uh, good morning to everybody. Um, before we move on to talk about some of the things that can accelerate your business for the future, I'd like you to think back to Steve Jobs at uh, Xerox. And I'm going to ask you the question, in the last two years, how many of you have looked at other markets, uh, sectors or competitors, uh, and built in some of those ideas and thoughts into your business. Um, what I'd like you to do is look at the screen and just mark the box that uh, best matches your situation. So we've got the results here and um, pretty encouraging to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, I, and you to be complimented on this. A lot of you looked at other businesses, other markets, other sectors uh, and incorporated them into your business very recently and certainly in the last two years. And for those of you that haven't, I really would ask you to consider doing that. And uh, in terms of implementing them, nearly half have implemented them, but 51 percent are still considering whether they'll be useful in their business. But that's an interesting uh, bit of feedback for us. Thank you very much for that. So let's move on. And um, the absolute must have starting point um, on this journey is to get rid of what we call limiting mindsets. Now, these mindsets will constrain, um, prevent and stop all sorts of potential within your business. And a typical limiting mindset is one I've heard many, many times, for example, from the sales director who tell you that we can't possibly get a price increase through in this market. And then they'll go on and give you all the evidence and information and notes that they've got to prove that that can't be done. Now, that is a limiting mindset. To avoid these limiting mindsets throttling your business, you must have mindsets that are open, thinking things like it might be possible to do this. Optimistic, thinking we have a real chance of making this work. Uh, questioning, thinking, how could we do that and how could we make that work in our business? And finally, infinite, thinking, that's done, but what's next for our business? Because markets are infinite and always changing. Things were all part of the human race. And because of that, we carry around in our head a set of assumptions, uh, beliefs and biases that are typically based upon our life experiences and the environment that we've operated in. Strongly held limiting mindsets will stifle and prevent all of the potential actions that a business can take by showing initiative, by creating new ideas and initiating change. So it's essential to get rid of these along with the rear view mirror that we mentioned in this uh, webinar. In short, you need to change your limiting mindsets to powerful mindsets. But how do you develop a powerful mindset? Well, start with having an open mindset. Open your mind to new different thoughts uh, and actions that might just work, that could just make a difference, a big difference, and explore them. 
avoid the that will not work in our market syndrome or we've always done it this way doubters who will constrain and prevent your business from going forward it's vital to have and maintain an open mindset be open to the possible and the possibilities as yoda indicates here your future potential is much much greater now at the minute we could all say after the last two years this is awful where do we go next or there's not much to be positive about is there and we could most certainly back it up if we wanted to with evidence for why we feel that way and then justify how we are thinking exactly as the sales director has done many many times in boardrooms that i've been involved in but put on another hat and you can see there is plenty to be optimistic about and things have improved and there's no question in our view that the worst is behind us for all of you who say the last two years couldn't have been much worse just listen to this story a fellow called Viktor Frankl uh, suffered through the horrors of the Nazi concentration camps in the Second World War. He was for a long period interred in Auschwitz, one of the worst, and we all know that horror, the horrors that happened on a daily basis there. When Viktor walked through the camp entrance with the famous Dante inscription talking about the entrance to hell and abandoning all hope, etc., he could have given up. No one really would have blamed him either. But Viktor Frankl didn't give up and he remained optimistic throughout in the worst imaginable daily circumstances and survived to write about his experiences. And here is one of his quotes. And I'd like you to just take a look at this and think for a moment. Now, John Milton, the poet, uh, has a similar thought process uh, where he says the mind is in its own place, as you can read here, and in its own way, will make a hell out of heaven and a heaven out of hell. And the point is that the future is really all about how we set our minds to look at things. But we're not talking about blind positivity here. That isn't what we mean by being optimistic. Positivity can be about saying things are fine when they're not. Optimism never denies the current situation and the current reality, but it believes that the future is positive, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and that we will move towards it provided we are fully in control of our thoughts and our beliefs. Useful information helps us in forming an optimistic view on the future. We learn more and gather more useful information by asking good questions. When we ask the right questions, we develop as a thinker. Why? Because the answers we get and the knowledge that we pick up as a result are the factors that actually energize our thinking. A good question is one that probes for knowledge that in itself shifts the way we think about something. This serves as a real catalyst uh, to bring about change. Here's some really good questions to ask of your business. What might we do differently or better? How might we improve our supplier relations? And this is a real beauty and one that you really all need to consider. Why would customers want to buy from us rather than from our competition? And you must answer that one. When a young woman, a typist, asked the question, what if I could paint over my typing mistakes in the 1950s? Something very significant happened, and here is the story.
So that's one powerful question that led to the person who asked it becoming a multimillionaire. Business is ever changing, ever evolving. This is so true in today's fast moving markets. The business that thinks we've done it will soon be passed by the competition. Business owners need infinite mindsets, which is Simon Sinek says here, are always looking at the long term and building for that. Recognize then that business is infinite in itself. James Cars, who was a professor from New York University, wrote a book in the 1980s called Finite and Infinite Games. In it, he describes finite games as involving known players with fixed rules and an agreed upon objective, just like winning in a game of football. However, an infinite game is defined as involving both known and unknown players with rules that constantly change. The objective is not simply to win. The objective is to keep playing and keep perpetuating the game. We must understand, therefore, that business is an infinite game. We need to keep at it. We need to keep working on the business, keep moving forward. And business is being built for the long term. And there's no such thing as a winning business because it doesn't exist. We have never won at business because there is no end to it and the changes and the challenges that it faces. Today's world totally illustrates this and the challenges are constant and continuous. The dynamic combination, therefore, of mindsets that are open, optimistic, questioning and infinite create the powerful mindset that you need to become a leader in your market. And that's whatever your market. Just like the rear view mirror, ditch those limiting mindsets. And as Einstein says, imagination can take you everywhere because the world is as you imagine it. Imagination conjures up powerful images of the future by using both sides of the brain. And this is the creative right hand side and the left hand side of the brain that works with logic. You probably know that scientists and psychologists tell us we only use about five to 10 percent of our brain power in our lifetime on average. But why is this? Let's go back to when we were children. As children, we learn by using both sides of our brain. Pictures are used in a book. They are linked to words and the process of word association is created utilizing both sides of the brain. The right side registers the picture and the brain's neurons then connect to the left side and the word that goes along with it. The result, word association, good learning and excellent retention of knowledge. Kids learn quickly because they have a completely unfettered and uncluttered mind. The problems start, however, when we get older and we clutter our mind with opinions and fixed mindsets that cause us to reject new learning and new ideas. We therefore never optimize or get near to optimizing our brain power. Our brains therefore become a massively underutilized human computer. To create true breakthrough results, therefore, we need to start opening our minds again fully, just as we did as children, and tap into both sides of the brain. For business owners, the message is, accept that you don't know what you don't know, and importantly, tap into the enormous amount of brain power that exists across your organization already. Just like an exhibition company who, with our help, got new direction from an unexpected source, which we'll cover later in a case study. Also, if you recognize that all good ideas do not sit in the heads of the directors, you will unlock a great new source of ideas and opportunities for your business. We'll move on and talk about our business improvement concept of triangular thinking now. As its name suggests, the concept uses three things that are proven to help business achieve breakthrough results if they're implemented correctly. Firstly, at the top of the triangle, imagination can create a new picture of the future, a vision of where you want to go. This is all about the future, Nothing to do with the past. As Graham said earlier, the past has gone and the conditions the past existed in have gone too, never to return. Think about creating a compelling vision for your business and one that captures the imagination of your people. At the start of the 1960s, as an example, at the start of his presidency, John F. Kennedy didn't announce a $60 billion program for space exploration. You can see how he positioned it to the American people here. Walt Disney also had a simple vision for Disney when it started its business and developed a, 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 as they branched out into theme parks. Once you've pictured the future and created your vision or goal, you need to focus on two strands that will help you achieve that vision. That's harnessing know-how and using creativity. 
If as a leader, you create the right conditions and allow input from people across your business, you'll discover that they exist in abundance. Know-how isn't just information, however. Know-how comes from people with experience, people with knowledge on how your business and market works, and also by accessing and learning from what other people and other businesses have done well that you might adapt for use in your business. Remember Steve Jobs at Xerox as a great example of this, but you can only do this if you open your mind to learning once again. And the creative piece comes by connecting things as Jobs did with the Xerox GUI idea when he took it to Apple. And it's interesting when you ask creative people how they did something, they'll say there was no lightning strike. They just saw something and developed their idea from it. And a good example is Henry Ford, who took the methods he saw being used in a Chicago meat packers factory where the carcasses were being carved up in a very, very organized line process. And he adapted it to create a, the motor car assembly line, changed the industry overnight. Another example of creativity building on something comes from James Dyson, who needed no less than 4,000 prototypes before he finally got his cyclone vacuum cleaner to market. Now, the original idea came from him watching how machines dealt with wood waste as logs were carved and cut in a wood factory. The solution seemed obvious to these creative people, but only after they had thought about what needs to change, determined what they needed to change, and then adapted it to fit their markets and created a way to do it. They connected other people's experiences to their thoughts and creatively built for a transformational future. Please take note of the next point. You must use the three points of the thinking triangle to get great results. You cannot view these as independent activities, but as three essential ingredients or elements, just like the fuel, oxygen, and heat that keeps a fire burning. Two will not be enough, the fire will go out, and in business two, all three are required to achieve the breakthrough results that we're talking about, particularly the need to incorporate creative thinking. There are some obvious traps to avoid. For example, it's easy to get creative thinking from those with no practical experience. As an example, you could invite a group of students along from the local business school or their local university, and you will get a mass of ideas from them. Unfortunately, those ideas will tend to go nowhere because they're not combined with know-how and many are simply not practical as a result. And this is why lots of brainstorming meetings turn out to be fun, but nothing ever comes of them. But it needn't be that way, as I'll, as I'll explain in a few moments. Using know-how alone doesn't work either. This will lead to an organization stagnating, doing more of the same. Uh, we have always done things this way. That's the way we do things here. It's always worked for us. Thinking this way will not even maintain the status quo in today's very, very challenging markets. Businesses constrained in this way will go backwards as competitors take the initiative. So you as business owners must be aware of people who will always have a logical objection to new ideas. It will mean your business going backwards if these thoughts continually prevail and your competitors, sadly, will simply forge ahead. So what you have to do is create the conditions in your business where your people with know-how can meet with people who think creatively and get the chance to think creatively themselves. This will bring fresh mindsets into the business with, uh, and allow you to create the best conditions to achieve breakthrough results for your business. Now, here's one of our case studies that makes the point very, very clearly. We were called into an organization with turnover of one and a half million and a 10% EBIT. They had ticked along for 12 years, but the profit level was never going to be enough for the MD to sell and retire on. This was his goal. They designed and built exhibition stands. They employed around 10 people, mostly senior, with years of gathering know-how and industry experience. We brought the team together as a group and asked them a simple question. What business are you in? We left them to think about this for about 45 minutes to exercise their minds. On returning, we went around the group in turn, and the answer was almost exactly the same from all of them. We're struggling with this one, guys. We simply design and build exhibition stands. That's what we do. Then we got to the youngest member of the team with less than six months experience and he said, I think we're more than that. What we do is create great meeting environments where our customers can meet their customers successfully. 
This is where we stepped in and facilitated some progress by asking, armed with this new mindset, what other areas or markets could you credibly attack? The group soon enthusiastically contributed to this discussion. We could design and build showrooms, build roadshow meeting areas, shopping mall presentation setups. The fact was that they always had the tools to go after these new markets credibly, but they had never had an open mindset about the business they could be in, for no one had ever thought creatively about it. They worked on a business plan with us and within one year had added £1 million to their turnover, maintaining the 10% EBIT. All because we gave the team the opportunity to think creatively and gave someone who probably would never have spoken up the encouragement to share their brain power. By just thinking differently about what business they were in, the youngest team member did this if you recall, they were able to attack new markets and added £750,000 to the value of the business with a little help from us in 18 months a return on investment of over 25 times. So there you have it. That's a real life example of how one of our clients generated real success. And we've had many, many more by using the concept of triangular thinking that we're talking about today. A couple of questions for you. Which company rethought and reframed their business when they said, we're not an athletic shoe manufacturer, we are a fashion brand? That was Reebok. Which company said we don't simply make toys, we're a child entertainment brand? That was Lego, and theme parks and films quickly followed. Lego picked up the idea of doing just that from Disney by using somebody else's experiences. And finally, to succeed today, you must move with pace in what we call the action zone, using your business agility, action that gets results. Productive actions come from thinking. All action with no thinking is disastrous, but equally, all thinking with no action is just like a bird without wings. Sadly, it will never fly. The action zone is an optimum time frame in which sufficient time has been given uh, and thinking, generating alternatives without procrastinating, yet enough time has been spent in creating alternatives before deciding on the correct course of action. The strongest message we can give you today, given our unpredictable future in whatever market you are in is this, you will not achieve breakthrough results by continuing with your current ways of working and trying to do more of what you've already been doing. Start changing or thinking about changing right now. And you don't need to change the culture in one massive swoop. It's very tough to achieve that. Rather begin by changing just a couple of things in the business and start building from there. And a couple of simple examples are taking away the pain of email. We're all buried in it. Uh, and I bet you are. By try Try to reduce the amount of email uh, by using and the use of the reply to all button, copyitis as I call it. Try taking an initiative to use a collaboration tool on a project rather than email. You'll find it'll reduce the intrays enormously and could very well improve your efficiency. The, usual, uh, the use of virtual meeting technology has become more of a norm over the last two years, obviously. And in our view, it will pay a, a big part in the future. Smart businesses will use this technology for meetings where there is no need for face-to-face. And significant cost savings can be achieved by reducing travel and downtime. But smart companies will also not underestimate the learning and the development that comes from people working together and observing how the best people operate working in the same office or environment. If you get the balance right, you can eliminate unnecessary downtime and travel costs, but still develop your business and your people. Do it this way and your productivity, efficiency, and staff learning and development and motivation will improve. So there are many things that can and, and will be done and achieved if the advice and ideas we've provided so far are listened to, developed, but most importantly, implemented. And we can look now at what sort of outcomes you can expect for your business by doing what we've suggested today. And to take you through that, I'm gonna hand you back to Graham. Thanks, David. So in summary, so far we've identified that businesses succeed or fail driven by their ability and willingness to adapt. What is required to make these changes and fuel the acceleration of your business. And explored some concepts and methods to create a new future for your business. So let's just look at a few of the benefits. Creating a more agile business, one that is able to adapt quickly and effectively will increase your organization's resilience to disruption. 
Consequently, your business will be better positioned to respond to new opportunities. And this will place you into a stronger competitive position. So take a new view of the future. Create a renewed direction, purpose and meaning for your business, which will present new opportunities for the business to grow and enable you to compete in new and different ways. Developing a renewed direction and purpose with your team will create a more engaged team, more capable of delivering results, achieving growth and delivering true breakthrough performance. The latter point is crucial to success. Take a walk in your people's shoes and think about how they might be thinking and feeling. Getting your people engaged in plotting the future and solving problems by thinking creatively makes them feel valued and part of the future in every way, crucial to both motivation and productivity. You as a leader can make this happen. Enable your team to start using their creative juices and collective brain power. Ask them some questions like, how might we improve our customer service and satisfaction? What other areas of our business need improvement? What would be the benefits if we could fix these? How could we continue to grow our top line profitably? One of the biggest challenges we are seeing and hearing from our SME clients is the ability to continue to profitably grow the top line. The business that fails to do this will fail as short-term financing, government support and the rest will not provide longer term sustainable success and good cash, cash positions now will soon evaporate. Are you and your team equipped to grow the business profitably over the next 12 months, next two years, next five years? Be honest with yourselves. And if you cannot see how you'll be able to grow, take the appropriate steps or get the right people to enable you to do it. Involving your, pro involving your people in your problem solving provides job satisfaction and motivation having them involved in creating a great solution and change, being part of creating that future. What a kick that provides, rather than merely the daily chore of doing what they always do, day in, day out. Like your competitors, is your intention to reverse into the space you used to fill, or are you ready to accelerate on the open road ahead? Our advice is simply, ditch the rear view mirror. Don't try to recreate the business you had before. Now is the time to adapt the business so that it will not just survive, but it will thrive and grow. We give you the option of booking a two hour free, no obligation consultation with Tinderbox to discuss your challenges and opportunities that you're facing and agree the next steps for building an action plan for your business, incorporating the concept of triangular thinking. Implement that plan with or without our help to create the potential for breakthrough results and look forward to a new successful horizon for your business. Our process is typically a three-step process. Review where we work alongside you to identify the challenges and opportunities, providing our own know-how processes and resources. We build a plan that is doable, actionable and practical. We then focus on implementation, and this is where many change initiatives go wrong. We focus on implementing where the right tinderbox specialist can support you to ensure a successful implementation and maximizing the results and delivering a great return on investment. In a moment, we'll go to the Q&A. But before we do that, I'm going to provide you with my contact details to enable you to take up our offer of a free discussion so we can identify as ways we could help you with your specific business challenges and opportunities. As we said at the beginning, we are a national organization. So I'll just be a, I, I'm just a contact point for this and would then refer it out to the per people that are out in the local regions. So some of you have been sending in your questions during the webinar presentation, and now is the time to facilitate answering some of those. And there are some very good questions because I've been looking at them as we've gone ahead. I just need, to right so i've got a number of questions 
just so I just had to move my screens on my computer so I'm facing you. Um, we had a comment which I will sort of respond to. There's a lot of history on show here, and we've had that before on this on this content, and it's true. But we use that to show that the businesses got where they are today by using these types of techniques and by taking these approaches and adapting to change and disruptive markets has been around for a long time. And we just use those very familiar organizations because they are familiar to people and it stood the test of time in many cases or not in others. Uh, another comment from Phil who says that problem starts with education and then a longer teach through critical thinking. I guess there's a lot of truth in that, I don't know. It's a long time since I was studying, but I do know that as a business owner and as a business leader, you can introduce that type of thinking into your business and you can use various techniques and approaches and learnings to help people be better at um, be better at critical thinking. Um, another comment from uh, Christopher Cullen that uh, the story of Bob Iger leaving Disney because of his self-imposed limitation of creativity is a good example and fantastic content. Thank you. Well, thank you, Christopher, for your comment and much appreciated. And yeah, very interesting. Uh, Disney is an organisation um, and Bob Iger moving on. Um, question from an anonymous person. I've been in business for seven years and feel now is the time. I've been in business for seven years and feel now is the time to scale my business. What is the first thing I should look at to ensure I get on the right foot? Um, I think we've probably answered some of that in the uh, in the webinar. And maybe David would like to add a little bit into this answer, but I think the concept of triangular thinking is a really good way of looking at how you can scale your business. David? Uh, yeah, just, just a couple of things. I think a lot of businesses um, get to this stage where uh, they've been in business for a number of years. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know your particular business details, but we see many businesses who are saying, you know, what do I do next? How do I scale up? Which is exactly the question you're asking. I think you, you've got to look at a number of things. It's 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 not easy to scale up if you're still doing everything yourself or you know, if your tentacles, exclude, excuse the expression, are all over the business. So you've got to put an organization structure together uh, that enables the business to grow, um, you know, strategically and commercially. Uh, you've got to make sure that the people who um, are responsible in the positions that you create are trained and effective in doing what they're doing. Otherwise, that will cost your business. Um, and ab above all, I think you've got to have a clear vision of, of, of where, you, where you want to go, where you want to take this business, thinking about the future, thinking about, uh, thinking about it creatively. And as Graham said, again, bringing in the things that you've already got, a bit of know-how um, and the creative thinking bit uh, that we mentioned in, in this, this webinar, the triangular thinking works perfectly for businesses who are looking to scale up. If you took the case study of the exhibition business, that's exactly what they wanted to do. They needed to, they were established, they were making money, but the amount of money they were making was not enough for the managing director to make his exit. So they needed a way of scaling up and it, it just needed a different way of thinking about the business. So that's a classic example of triangular thinking working. But I think also organizational structure and delegating and having the right people to delegate to, which is where good people come into play, is essential. Thanks, David. Uh, Gabriel Quinn has asked, are there any tips for transport transitioning from a micro social enterprise into one that will be UK wide and eventually worldwide in the future? Um, I would pick up again on the same, you know, the triangular thinking is a great way of, of looking at the future, but I'd also recommend highly that you get some experience around you that people have done some of that before, because I'm not really an advocate of reinventing the wheel. Um, I, I was an advocate of trying new things, but um, a lot of know-how in international expansion, uh, geographical expansion, there's no, various ways of doing it, and it's really worth uh, getting some experience around you to help shortcut the learning curves um, and learn and learn quickly from people who've done it previously. Um, as a business owner, we can innovate and be creative, but how do we get existing clients, potential clients, to embrace the new and quirky, fresh approach? if their brain is already locked into existing more historic styles and ways of working? Good question, Scott. Um, I think that's around your sales approach, personally. Um, I, I think it's getting to understand what a client 
is actually looking to do and looking to achieve and then strategically pitching positioning your product um, or service along along the lines of what how it will add value to their business again i think david's got some great experiences in this area so david you might want to add a little bit of value there i think you, you you're spot on graham i mean um you know being very candid here in in sort of 12 years of experience in this business going around many many smes and i've got to be candid one of the weakest areas we find and it's a shame for the business is the frontline sales operation isn't up to scratch now in terms of this question i don't know what the situation is but just think about it this way uh, the good salesperson isn't somebody who talks and talks and talks and talks the best salespeople are those who listen who go to the customers, whatever your customers or clients, uh, they ask open questions, they gather a huge amount of information which relates to what the customer or client is looking for, and then they fashion a solution from your offer that meets that client or customer need. And if you've got people on the front line doing that, you'll be successful because you're meeting whatever the customer's needs are at that particular point in time. Uh, and that's what you know, that's the way you make sales, and that's the way that, that you make profitable sales. So my advice to any business would be always keep an eye on your top, on your front line, rather your front line operation. Make sure you know what your sales team or salesperson or whatever is up to and make sure they've got the skills to actually take your business forward by being really good listeners and asking appropriate questions of the customers they serve. Thanks, David. Uh, next question is, is from an anonymous attendee. I have a business with three friends. However, I make all the important decisions. I feel drained and overwhelmed and feel like it's time to part ways. We're looking to expand the business within a year, but I want to expand it alone and start a new chapter. This has been my original business plan from the start and the expansion of all my ideas and hard work. What should I do and how should I approach it? Um, that's a really difficult question to answer in this format. Um, there's a lot of background information that would be required to answer that question. Um, I, it's a, it is really really challenging to answer that. I'm I'm happy to have a discussion with you if you'd like, um, but a, you know a background of how you've worked together with these three friends, how you could exit on your own. Um, it could be also candidly looking in the mirror, your own leadership style and engagement with the other people. I I'm just throwing stuff up there. Um, there's really not enough knowledge of your business and and your relationships as, with each other. Uh, to answer that question substantially. Christopher Cullen, has anybody ever implemented creative thinking time? I think it's a really good suggestion. Uh, working, you know, 20% of working hours spent on creative thinking could be a little bit much, uh, but could be solo or brainstorming groups. I think it's always good to bring groups of people into creative thinking. Um, together, everybody can generate better ideas and it's also that combination of creative thinking and know-how um, so hopefully people have done that uh, what metrics do you Phil Summers what metrics do you use to measure results while well, return on investment profitable growth um, really depends on the business to business depends on what the vision is and what the objectives are and then you measure your, your performance against those metrics but um, often in triangular thinking, we're looking at improving returns on investment. We're looking at achieving larger market share, increasing profitability. Um, and, and it probably leads a little bit into Barry Hills that I think we all agree that motivation of staff can unleash a lot of potential. However, in order to profitably increase the top line, is it not, not essential to have access to reliable data such as real-time margins and product costs? Absolutely. I've got to understand your metrics of your business. You've got to understand the financial structure of your business. And there's a lot of data available in most businesses in today. There's probably too much data available. The key thing for me is always to is always to try and funnel down into some key metrics and keep it to a, a, a handful or less. Um, I think many companies fail in, to achieve their, their real purpose because they fail to measure the right things and keep it focused. And it gets confusing if you measure too many metrics. Um, I'm a big advocate of trying to find one that will almost be the barometer of where the business is. And it might be a bit of an algorithm and a, and a mathematical, not just a single metrics, but it might be um, a, sig a single uh, data point. It might be 
um, a, a, a calculation like a return on investment um, or, or something else creative that will give you a very easy and quick health check of your business and whether you're going in the right direction. But absolutely, data is is important. You know, it's like driving a car. If you if you don't know what speed you're doing on the speedometer, how do you know whether you're keeping to the speed limit or not? Um, metrics are important, and there's lots of data around. As a, as a business owner who initiates the business, should you insist on the vision of the company you create or allow the stakeholders to adapt, modify the vision? I think what we've suggested in triangular thinking and where our ethos is, is that teams work and bringing people together and having um, people's input, it creates a common ownership of that vision. And it's a lot easier to bring people along with you, obviously you're going to influence it, but I'm a big advocate of, and I know David is, so I'm not even going to ask him to contribute. Sorry, David. Um, big advocate of people contributing to the to the um, to the vision. As I say, it's it creates that it reduces the necessity for you to have to sell it to them. Um, they'll come along for the ride much more willingly. Ray Black sustainability credentials will be critical to scaling up for companies of any size very soon. Just out of a meeting on supporting SMEs in certification at United Nations level. Okay, yeah, I think that's a good comment. Um, absolutely agree with you, Ray. Um, feedback from Scott Wall. Thank you for your advice and today's interesting thought provoking contact. Well, thank you, Scott, for posting that. It's really appreciated. Uh, we do tend to present a little bit of a vacuum on webinars. So I really do appreciate that you've um, that you've um, taken the time to give us that quick feedback. Selling has changed in the last 18 months, according to Ray Black, after 36 years in sales and senior management. I've learned brand new techniques in ethical virtual selling offline. Would love a chat with the speakers. Yeah, we're available. We've put our contact details up. Uh, we're on our website, Tinderbox website. We're all there with our contact details. And a final comment from Alex Hughes. Thanks, great webinar, very thought provoking and useful. Well, thank you for being here, Alex. And again, thank you for your comment. But it really does, it's much appreciated. It means a lot when we get that uh, sort of feedback live as it is. So thank you all for your time. I hope I've answered all your questions. I think we're just about on time, there or thereabouts, maybe slightly over. But you asked a lot of questions, which is brilliant. And I'm glad you've all enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Dave Graham, and thank you, David. And on behalf of the FSB and all the people that are still with us, an amazing amount of people are still with us, considering people have to go to other meetings. Can we thank you for a brilliant, thought-provoking um, session, which I know has been appreciated by a lot of people. So thank you both. We'll hopefully do some work with Tinderbox again, because I think they've got a lot to offer our FSB members of all sizes and all sectors. So thank you all for joining us. And can we just say that ditch the rear view mirror in business-wise, but preferably not on your commute home. Um, so uh, I thought I'd better say that before someone sues us. So um, thanks, everybody. Thank you, David. Thank you, Graham. And thank you, everyone, for attending and have a, a great rest of the day. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.